From the station working for you, this is WRTV News at 5, streaming now. The president has committed an unspeakable assault on our nation and our people. I join the Senate Democratic leader in calling on the vice president to remove this president by immediately invoking the 25th Amendment. Now at 5, capital chaos fallout. The House Speaker and others call for immediately removing President Trump from office. But there's more. Nancy Pelosi went one step further. If that doesn't happen, Congress may move ahead with impeaching the president a second time. Thanks for joining us here at 5 o'clock. I'm Mark Mullins. And I'm Amanda Starantino. Just 24 hours ago, we were all watching the storming of the U.S. Capitol by protesters and Trump supporters. And now, as ABC's Andrew Dimber shows you tonight, there are bipartisan calls to remove the president now. After a night of lawlessness in the nation's capital, Congress finally ratifying the Electoral College vote, cementing Joe Biden's victory on becoming the next president of the United States. Joseph R. Biden Jr. of the state of Delaware has received 306 votes. In what is traditionally a purely ceremonial process, the joint session of Congress was marred by violent extremists who stormed the Capitol. Following President Trump's speech, repeating his false claims of voter fraud, the rioters, some described as domestic terrorists, breaching barricades with ease, even appearing to get help from and taking selfies with some Capitol Police officers. President-elect Biden blasting Trump and the rioters. Don't dare call them protesters. They were a riotous mob. The Trump fanatics confronting police inside the halls of Congress, some waving Confederate flags, one even making it to Speaker Nancy Pelosi's office. Vice President Pence and other lawmakers whisked away by security, others left hiding in closets and under desks. It's wrong and we've got to rebuild our nation. The attempted takeover taking a deadly turn. Four people died, three from medical emergencies, and one woman was shot and killed by police after she was allegedly part of the mob trying to force their way into the House chamber. Police also recovering two working pipe bombs at the Republican and Democratic Party headquarters, later safely detonating them. After the dust settled on one of democracy's darkest days, a bipartisan group of congressional leaders blaming one person for inciting the chaos, Donald Trump. The president caused this. The president is unfit and the president is unwell. And now growing calls from leaders from both parties to Good invoke afternoon. the 25th Amendment to remove Trump from office just 13 days before his term expires. A very dangerous person who should not continue in office. Capitol Police say they arrested 14 people, local D.C. police adding 52 more arrests. And according to authorities, some of those arrested were carrying illegal guns and other weapons. The Department of Justice says charges are coming today. Andrew Dimbert, ABC News, Washington. Well, the chaos and confusion on Capitol Hill is behind the bipartisan calls for people to be punished, including the president. And what about the futures of the vice president and Senator Mike Braun? Our Rafael Sanchez took those questions to the WRTV political insiders. So, Tom John, if it's not the impeachment, if it's not the 25th Amendment, is it a censure? It's something they could do more quickly, and it would make a point, particularly if it was a significant bipartisan effort. I think another thing is there will probably be federal prosecutors that look at, is this something that was essentially criminal and as far as inciting riots? I don't know if it is or isn't, but is that the sort of thing that gets looked at? But I think most of those things are post January 20th. And between now and then, the real issue should be ensuring that transfer of power. We can't go on as a country without some accountability uh, with respect to what happened, the events of yesterday. What do you see as the future of Vice President Mike Pence and Senator Mike Braun? Tom John. Well, I think both of them came out of this uh, as showing their character when they did this. And Mike Pence, at the end of the day, has tried to serve our country in the best way possible and prove to be the good man and strong man that he is and the principled man that he is. Mike Pence had a good day yesterday, and I think uh, Mike Braun had a good statement yesterday. That's it. At the end of the day, we've had four years of Mike Pence enabling the behavior that led to yesterday, as has Mike Braun in his time in the United States Senate. Both of them are accountable for what they've done that led to the day. Uh, yesterday was one instance of um, Mike Pence doing something right. Political insiders, and of course, our conversation continues right now on WRTV.com. 
And tonight on WRTV News at 6, Governor Eric Holcomb responds to the president's comments in which he said Vice President Mike Pence lacked courage. The governor's remarks at 6. Marion County officials say they are ready to move forward with getting people vaccinated against COVID-19. Today, Mayor Joe Hogsett announced the Marion County Health Department will start administering the vaccine on Monday. The vaccines will be available to people over the age of 80, plus law enforcement workers and health officials. Mayor Hogsett says his office will focus on making sure Marion County residents stay safe and informed. The spread of covid was rivaled only by the spread of misinformation about COVID. We must do better. In the coming days and weeks, I will be calling on faith leaders, community leaders, and my fellow elected officials to help connect residents to the vaccine, as well as spread factual information about the vaccine. Again, people el eligible to get the vaccine include medical professionals, members of law enforcement, and just announced this week, people over the age of 80. All appointments will be made through the state, meaning you don't call your primary physician to get one. Eligible seniors can go to ourshot.in.gov or call 211 starting tomorrow to make an appointment. Many of those appointments will be at healthcare facilities like IU Health. We're seeing just tremendous hardship um, and death of, um, from COVID, and it's almost unbearable most days. But then you walk back over there and you see a glimmer of hope. So it just, it's really encouraging, especially to us in the building, to see that we're proactively partnering with the state to help us get out of this. Several local health departments say they are working on plans to help homebound seniors get vaccinated. As soon as those are finalized, we will pass that information along to you. The number of new positive cases is up again today, according to the state. There are more than 7,300 new cases reported. Those results were recorded between December 15th and yesterday. The number of newly reported deaths of people with COVID is about the same as yesterday. The 81 deaths we learned of today occurred between October 7th and yesterday. Well, hundreds of thousands of lives have been taken by COVID-19, but the numbers are real people with families who are missing their loved ones every day. We want to share their stories. WRTV's Alyssa Donovan explains how the loss of a loving wife and mother has left a family with words to live by. She always had a motto, I got this. If something was wrong, she'd say, I got this. That life motto and her positivity, two of many qualities that made Tracy Mollis so special. Everybody said she had she had the biggest smile. You know, she lit up a room when she smiled. It's a smile Jeffrey Mollis fell in love with the moment they met. It was her senior year in high school, and I'm, I'm a couple years older than she is. I knew right then, you know, I was like, I seen her at her house, and I was like, she's mine. You know, I want her. The two attached at the hip throughout their nearly 25-year marriage. Like my best friend said, you didn't see Jeff without Tracy, and you didn't see Tracy without Jeff. And once they had their two girls, the foursome was rarely apart, taking family trips and Tracy, a very involved mom, leading Girl Scout troops and the PTO at school when the girls were young. Our kids was our passion. You know, it was our life. But everything changed in March, early in the pandemic, when Jeffrey contracted COVID-19 at a job site. I got sick. Me and my wife started sleeping in separate rooms. It was too late because she would got it. 45-year-old Tracy, high risk for complications with the virus. Years earlier, she was diagnosed with Wagner's granulomatosis, which had impacted her lungs. And the day after Easter, she got hospitalized and she never came home. The day Tracy was put on a ventilator, her husband couldn't be there, but the nurse relayed a message. She told me to tell you before she went under, I got this, you know. Oh, hold on. <laughs> so those were her last words to me, you know. After six weeks on a ventilator and other machines, Mullis was allowed into the hospital to hold his wife's hand while she passed. And when she did... You know, you just feel it. And I've always told everybody, we have soulmates. She was telling me she was going to be okay. And while some days are harder than others, 
Mullis and his daughters are getting by with a little help from Tracy and the words that she so often used to get through hard times. I got this. You know, that's what we live by. That's, that's our go-to now, is I got this. I'm Alyssa Donovan, WRTV. Alyssa, thank you. Thousands of Hoosiers have died since the coronavirus pandemic began. We've lost parents, children, friends, neighbors, and we know they're more than just numbers, and WRTV wants to keep the memories alive. We're asking for your help to put names to and faces to numbers. If you've lost someone close to you, connect with us. We want to share their stories so that those taken from us are never forgotten. You can reach us at facesofcovid at wrtv.com. Personally, working in this field, um, I've lost over 40 students to gun violence. 2020, the deadliest year in Indianapolis. Next at five, we look at the causes behind youth gun violence and an organization wrapping its arms around their students. Nothing new here. Lots of clouds across central Indiana, but when we'll see some sunshine, we'll talk about the changes ahead. Indianapolis recorded 245 total homicides in 2020, surpassing the 2017 previous high of 179. WRTV Stephanie Wade speaks with a group working to change the narrative in some of our most vulnerable neighborhoods and highlights the need to address circumstances and environments surrounding youth involved in gun violence. Uh, we lost a few students um, this year to gun violence. The year before, we lost several. 2020 was the deadliest year in the Circle City with the recorded 245 homicides. It's hard to explain because it's been my whole life. So, I mean, I'm 37 and it's hard for me each time. I can't imagine being 15 and losing seven friends in one calendar year. The director of engagement at Voices Corporation, an arts-based youth center organization founded 10 years ago, to enhance the lives of some of the most vulnerable youth in Indianapolis. Literally, well, I know, like literally growing up, seeing everybody in my family that sell drugs or stealing or being in the gang, you feel me? And it's literally just been generational. It's been my grandparents and then my parents. Austin Juarez was shot in the leg during an altercation in May. I've seen a lot of people, a lot of friends that just trying to make money. Whether it was good or bad, that's all they were trying to do. They're just trying to make money, trying to survive, trying to live like everybody else, like you and me. He says instead of letting it get him down, he used it to motivate him for better. Now, working to get his GED with the help from staff at Voices. Make sure that they don't, you know, internalize that or manifest that into delinquency or depression. You don't see a lot of people in a community who understand that. Like a lot of people pass that external judgment. They see the news articles and they're like, well, these kids shouldn't have guns. These kids shouldn't be doing that. But you also have to understand some of these kids, and just to be honest, if they didn't have a gun, they would be the next breaking news headline. I have a student who his best friend was shot and killed in front of him and he held him as he died and then found out that bullet was intended for him. How do you, how do you make that kid put his gun down? Despite the violence, Voices ensures kids have a safe space with them. They affirm their experiences and emotions and make sure they know they're supported. My whole life has been the same thing. A bunch of people say they want to help. They, they, they want me to change, see different than me. And it's always the same, you feel me, BS. It's the same, bro, you feel me? They, they support for a little bit, you feel me, and they give up. Violence is not going anywhere. But what we can do is we can look at our students, look at the ones who have had the most interaction with violent situations and try to do our best to remove them from that and put them in positions of power and privilege. In a year highlighting such divide, Brandon Randall says, it's time we look at why gun violence is happening and allow youth to share their voices. We strategically put young people in places where they're leading the discussions. They're the ones drafting policy and proposing solutions. Stephanie Wade, WRTV. 
Voices has a leadership development program where students go through six weeks of community engagement, identity, and image and conflict resolution topics. They are working to expand this program by going to different apartment complexes and community centers. If you know of any neighborhood or area that could use the resources, contact them online and they love to organize a leadership program in your community. Kevin. Uh, Amanda, I promise you it's a new day. It just all sounds the same. Lots of clouds, temperatures locked in the 30s. We only moved five degrees today from 33 up to 38. We sit at 36 in Indy right now. Shelbyville's at 38 degrees. Okay, let's follow the clouds to the south. Along the Ohio River, there's some very light snow or flurries, some of that not reaching the ground yet, but that's the very northern edge of a weather system. Could have some light accumulations along Interstate 64 and south. Low pressure down in Mississippi will move east, and that will take most of the moisture with it, just en enough that maybe along the Ohio River or slightly Slightly north of that, maybe Bedford or Seymour could see a snow flurry or two, but that is off to the east, and we're in for a dry Friday and weekend. Do you see what I see? Saturday and Sunday, I'm not saying it's going to be blazing sunshine, but we should see breaks in the cloud cover, and we may actually see a few breaks during the day tomorrow. Temperatures in the morning with cloudy skies right around 30 degrees. The afternoon temperatures struggle. Will be a cold day. That wind will be out of the north and cold, generally 10 to 15 miles per hour, but it's that northerly direction that'll make 30 to 34 degrees feel pretty cold. You'll have to dress for certainly the lower 20s. Into the week weekend we go. There's your mixture of clouds and sunshine both Saturday and Sunday. Temperatures close to the mid-30s. If you're looking for some warmth, you'll have to be patient. We'll find that as we go later in the seven-day forecast. Saturday still quite cool, 34 degrees. As I show you the seven-day forecast, look to the right side of your screen. When we get to Wednesday, temperatures will be above 40 degrees, 45 on Thursday. Everything is relative, right, Mark? So temperatures that feel very cold now, you just get back into the mid-40s or so, and it can feel much, much warmer. But this is typically our coldest stretch of the year right now. Mark? It's all in your mindset right there. Thanks, Kevin. Appreciate it. Still ahead here on the News at 5, a local business doing good by sharing one of the comforts of home to troops around the world. Floors to your home, that too. <laughs> A small business owner in Hancock County is working for good at his cigar shop in Fortsville. WRTV's Kelsey Anderson explains how he's supporting troops thousands of miles away. Maduro on Main here in Fortville is coming up on its third year in business. And each month, owner Larry Harnish sells hundreds of cigars to his customers, offering them the peace and tranquility that comes with smoking a premium cigar. Now he and his customers are working to get that same feeling to our American heroes, no matter where they're stationed. So my total this year will be 518 cigars. Larry Harnish owns Maduro on Main, and throughout the year, he and his customers fill this box with cigars that will eventually be sent around the world to our troops. I've got a father-in-law who is a World War II veteran. My father served. I got a brother-in-law who served. So I thought, okay, this is a neat thing to do. He does this through the national program Cigars for Warriors. Since their inception, they've sent more than a million cigars to American warriors in combat zones and high-risk areas overseas. There's so many weird things going on in these, in these combat zones, so much high stress, uh, op tempos high, sometimes it's boredom that causing a lot of stress. Storm Bowen is the CEO and co-creator of the Cigars for Warriors project. And he says he knows their charity is often viewed in a skewed light because it supports tobacco use. But as a combat veteran himself, he says he knows from experience the peacefulness it can bring. Uh, we do have uh, two MDs and four psychologists that have written their names behind us. Um, the psychologist said mental health benefits outweighs any potential health risk. Harnish tells me the more than 500 cigars he's collected this year are all thanks to his customers. Some people donate a bunch, you know, a bundle of 10, 20, et cetera. But for the most part, it's the man or woman come in who knows somebody who's deployed and they'll buy four cigars heading into the weekend and they'll throw one of them in the box. He says he got into the cigar business because of the camaraderie that comes with it. And he's glad he can help our American heroes experience the same thing. I love the camaraderie that comes along with it. And so if you can share that peaceful feeling, it doesn't matter your race or religion or political views or wealth status, 
Cigars are a common denominator, and all that stuff goes out the window, and you just share the common c the cigar. So I thought, you know, on that end, if you can bring that little relaxation and that peace to somebody out there in the serving, then why not? She said. No, I had, I had people trying to sneak cocktails. And that was Kelsey Anderson reporting. If you want to learn more about the program and how you can get involved, visit cigarsforwarriors.org. New data shows bullying is down in the state of Indiana. I'm Kara Kenny. We'll tell you why one lawmaker says anti-bullying legislation is needed now more than ever. And next at 530, building stronger relationships between the black community and police. The steps being taken in one neighborhood.